A little bit late coming from the airport. We'll start in about five minutes. All right? Thank you. Appreciate it very much. I'm uh, Attorney General John Southers, and it's my great privilege uh, to co host uh, this event with the Lawfare Project. Uh, we're expecting the ambassador shortly, but we thought uh, that we'd uh, go ahead and get going. Uh, folks, I first became aware of the term lawfare in a visit to Israel with a group of state attorneys general in 2006. Uh, as I understood it at the time, it was a term being used to describe some lawsuits that were being filed against politicians, journalists, authors, cartoonists, uh, and anyone else uh, who was brave enough to address the threat of radical Islam. And these were lawsuits that were being filed all over the world. Uh, in essence, as I understand it, lawfare is the use of the law as a weapon of war uh, with the intent to manipulate and undermine the rule of law, particularly uh, international law. And lawfare, as many of you may know, is now the subject of much discussion nationally and internationally. Uh, and we're here today to learn more about the issue from the Lawfare Project an organization dedicated to identifying, analyzing, and formulating a response to law lawfare in all its manifestations. Uh, and no better person to introduce us to that subject than Brooke Goldstein. Brooke Goldstein is a uh, New York City-based human rights attorney, author, and award-winning filmmaker. Uh, she serves as the director of the Lawfare Project, a nonprofit organization, uh, as I say, dedicated to raising the awareness about and facilitating a response to the abuse of Western legal sy systems and human rights law. Uh, Brooks' recent book, which I think is, has copies here, co authored with Aaron Itan Meyer, and entitled Lawfare uh, The War Against Free Speech, a uh, First Amendment Guide for Reporting in an Age of Islamist Lawfare. Uh, this book gives practical guidance to journalists who wish to speak truthfully about the national security threats faced by liberal democracies. Brooks' award-winning documentary film, The Making of a Martyr, uncovers the illegal state-sponsored indoctrination and recruitment of Palestinian children for suicide-homicide attacks. Filming Martyr, uh, Brooks secured first-hand interviews with active and armed members of various Islamic terrorist groups, as well as with families of suicide bombers children in prison for attempting to blow themselves up, teachers at terrorist-run schools, and others involved in the phenomenon of child suicide bombing. Brooks, a regular commentator on Fox News, and has been featured in several media, including CNN, New York Sun, uh, Defense Technology International, and on WABC News Talk Radio, and has been published in a variety of sources, including the New York Daily News, Commentary Magazine, The American Spectre, Counter-Terrorist Magazine, and Special Ops Magazine. That must be a real interesting magazine, Special <laughs> Ops Magazine. Uh, Brooke is a seasoned public speaker and has been invited to brief government officials at the U.S. State Department, the White House, Pentagon, uh, the Parliament, uh, the United Kingdom Parliament, and the U.S. Central Command on issues of asymmetric warfare and human rights. She's the 2007 recipient of the E. Nathaniel Gates Award for Outstanding Public Advocacy, the 2009 Inspire Award bestowed by the Benjamin Cardoza School of Law. She formerly served as an adjunct fellow at the Hudson Institute and is currently an associate fellow at the Henry Jackson Society and a Lincoln Fellow at the Claremont Institute. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, it's my privilege uh, to introduce uh, Brooke Goldstein to talk, talk to us about this subject of lawfare. Thank you. Good afternoon. I am so honored to be here um, and to be hosted by the Attorney General. So, so grateful to their office uh, for helping organize this and especially to Terry who has been outstanding. So thank you so much. Um, so I thought, you know, I'd approach this, you know, less as a didactic lecture and just tell you a little bit about how I became involved uh, to the point where I'm now running two not-for-profits and how I became aware of the phenomenon of lawfare. And as the Attorney General mentioned, um, I made a documentary film called The Making of a Martyr. 
and it's about the recruitment of innocent Muslim children to become suicide bombers. And I started making the film when I was in my second year of law school, and I happened to be taking a class called Human Rights and the Child, and we learned about the Convention on the Rights of the Child and its optional protocol. We learned about the UN Charter and all the lofty principles contained therein. Every child has a right to life, Every child has the right to a media, an education, for of incitement to hate and to kill himself. And I came home one day and I turned on television. And there broadcast before me was an image of a 15-year-old, physically handicapped, rumored to be mentally handicapped, Palestinian boy named Hussam Abdu with live explosives strapped around his waist. And just 48 hours before, he had been recruited by the Al-Aqsa Martyr Brigades. He was paid the equivalent of 20 American dollars. He was filmed for a farewell video, and he was driven by adults to a checkpoint, and he was told to explode himself amongst the Palestinians waiting online to get into Israel. But what was so fascinating about Hussam's story is that instead of blowing himself up, he proved smarter than the adults who recruited him. He actually turned himself into the IDF, the Israeli Defense Forces. He was arrested. He was tried and convicted of attempted murder. And now he's serving out the eighth year of his sentence in the Hasharon prison, which is just outside Jerusalem. And it occurred to me at that point when I was a second year law school uh, student, law student, that there was a legal argument here that nobody was making, and that is that the child suicide bomber is as much a victim of a human rights abuse as are child soldiers in Africa, because the child bomber is a product of very shrewd recruitment and brainwashing strategy that literally targets these children from infancy. They're taught through their school textbooks, by their television, by their radio media, to revere martyrdom and to kill themselves in the name of jihad. And I thought this was so compelling that I wanted to write my term paper on it. So the more that I researched, the more that I realized that the phenomenon of child suicide bombing was in no way restricted to the Palestinian territories. In fact, in Sudan and Pakistan, parents of children were being paid up to $12,000 to donate their child to the Taliban so that they were educated in madrasas or what we like to call suicide schools. They were tortured, they're hung upside down for days from uh, the roofs of these schools until they memorized the Quran. In Iraq, handicapped children were being recruited. There, were, there was a child with Down syndrome who was blown up by remote control at a polling station in Iraq. And also a couple of years ago, there were two children who were left in the back seat of a truck who were driven by adults to a coalition force checkpoint and they were also blown up by remote control. In Afghanistan, children as young as six years old were being recruited for suicide attacks. One of those children was told his belt would explode flowers. And in Yemen, over 50% of all the combatants in Yemen right now are under the age of 18. And in Saudi Arabia, children are being taught in their textbooks to kill Jews and to kill Christians as the enemies of Islam. And the United Nations Relief Works Agency, or UNRWA, which is funded, I think, about 90% of its budget by the United States, teaches Palestinian children from textbooks supplied by Hamas, hires teachers off the Hamas payroll, and teaches in those schools that those children should become suicide bombers. So all in all, you can make the argument that by funding UNRWA, the United States is aiding and abetting the murder of innocent Palestinian children. And I, the more I did this research, the more I noticed that it wasn't just a phenomenon. You know, the indoctrination and recruitment of innocent Muslim children towards violence was not a phenomenon that was restricted to the Muslim world. In fact, it was happening in the West as well. The UK MI5, which is their equivalent of the FBI, sees DVDs being marketed to UK-born Muslim children teaching them how to make bombs. It featured a videotape of a real beheading to desensitize them from violence. 
The UK Channel Project now has over 200 children in government custody that they're trying to be rehabilitated because they've been recruited for suicide bombing and other violent activities. And throughout Europe, North Africa, and Australia, satellite companies like the French-based uh, uh, UTELSAT or the Spanish-based Overon, Arabsat, Noorsat, Indosat, They've all been in the habit of airing terrorist media, Hezbollah's Al Minara network, Hamas's Al Aqsa TV, teaching innocent Muslim children to kill themselves. And what's been created also in the West is a very problematic homegrown radicalization problem. And yet anybody who talks about it is called Islamophobic. So for example, maybe some of you have, uh, you recall the hearings that Peter King put on that uh, examined the status of radicalization of American-born Muslim children. He put Somali parents on the stand to testify with tears in their eyes how their children were being kidnapped by Al-Qaeda in the United States. They were being flown across borders and they were being trained. And Peter King was called an Islamophobe for advocating that the rights of Muslim children in America be upheld. And despite the massive human rights violation occurring against innocent Muslim children, Human Rights Watch, Amnesty International, Coalition to Stop the Use of Child Soldiers, all remain silent on this issue. So I thought that this was something that I really wanted to raise awareness about. So over a period of two years, I, and at quite some risk to my own life, I traveled in and out of the West Bank to Janine, Ramallah, to Tilkam, to Nablus, to various areas, and I ended up securing interviews with leaders of terrorist organizations that recruit children as suicide bombers. I secured interviews with uh, families of suicide bombers. I went into Israeli prisons and I interviewed children who had been caught trying to blow themselves up. I went into the programmer's office of Palestinian Authority TV and I asked them why they were airing cartoons aimed at Palestinian children, teaching them to kill themselves. And what happened was I released uh, the culmination of these interviews in the documentary film, The Making of Martyr. And I was quite fortunate. I submitted the film to the United Nations Documentary Film Festival, and we ended up getting an award for best film. And because of that award, we were accepted into a slew of other film festivals around the world. And I spent a year and a half traveling the world and basically speaking about this issue. And my message was very simple. There is no justification whatsoever, religious, political, moral, or otherwise, to murder innocent Muslim children. And any so-called occupation of Palestinian land, any failure of the Camp David peace agreements is not an excuse to teach Muslim children to blow themselves up. And in areas where there was no Israeli occupation, like in Iran, Turkey, Saudi Arabia, Egypt, Lebanon, Syria, Jordan, why are they teaching their children to revere violence and to kill Americans. So as I went around the world and was speaking about these issues at film festivals, I ended up getting asked to write some articles and I ended up getting some media spots. And the more I did this, the more I started paying attention to the other people who were in the counterterrorism community who were doing the same thing. And I noticed that anyone, as the Attorney General mentioned, who was brave enough to speak openly, to speak critically about militant Islam, about terrorism, about its sources of financing, started getting sued. In Europe, there were dozens of defamation and hate speech lawsuits filed against people who were talking about these issues publicly or even parroting radical Islam. I'm sure uh, everyone here is familiar with the Danish cartoons of Mohammed with a bomb in his turban. Well, a Saudi law firm was hired allegedly on behalf of 94,000 descendants of Muhammad and sued the Danish newspaper Politiken for publishing those cartoons for the crime of offending Muslims. In the United Kingdom, a defamation lawsuit was filed by the North London Mosque against Policy Exchange because Policy Exchange went undercover, bought some books in the North London Moss bookstore, translated them, and released the translations to the public.
and the North London Mosque sued Policy Exchange for defamation. The Saudi Al Rahajdi Bank sued the Wall Street Journal for reporting on the fact that the Saudi authorities were monitoring bank accounts within that bank for ties to terrorism. In the, uh, uh, in the Netherlands, again, the uh, democratically elected official Gert Wilders was sued for making a 10-minute film called Fitna, comprised uh, almost in the majority of quotes from the Qurans and scenes of radical imams preaching death to gays and to Jews and to Christians, and he was sued for hate speech against Muslims. And in Canada, Ezra Levant, who is a television personality there on Sun TV, was also hauled before the Canadian Human Rights Commission for the crime of offending Muslims by republishing the Danish cartoons of Muhammad in the now defunct Western Standard magazine. And the same thing with Mark Stein. Mark Stein was asked to appear and defend himself before the Canadian Human Rights Commission for his book, America Alone, which is about demographics, about the rising numbers of Christians, Jews, and Muslims in America. And in the United States, despite the fact that we have the First Amendment, we've also seen a steady increase in the filing of frivolous and malicious defamation lawsuits against counter-terror experts, against authors, against people in the media, against anyone who writes or speaks publicly about issues of national security. Uh, concern. The Islamic Society of Boston sued Steve Emerson, The David Project, Fox News, and 30 other media defendants for writing about the fact that the mosque was receiving funds from Saudi Arabia. Cass Ballinger, a former congressman, Cass Ballinger, was sued by the Council on American Islamic Relations for reporting to the FBI, sorry, for testifying to the FBI that the Council on American Islamic Relations or CARE is, quote, a fundraising arm for Hezbollah. A former client of mine, Hassan Dial Islam, an Iranian American who fled Iran, who was persecuted in Iran and his family is still persecuted there, fled to the United States because he thought he could come here and write and speak freely. He created a blog and a website that maybe a couple thousand people visited on which he described National Iranian American Council, or NIAC, a lobbying arm on behalf of the Iranian government. He is now involved in defending himself for the third year. Joe Kaufman, who is a citizen acti activist, staged a peaceful, lawful, permitted, 10-person protest outside a Six Flags Park in Texas against the Islamic Circle of North America that he said was linked to terrorist group. He was sued by seven Dallas area Islamic organizations that he had never even mentioned. The judge threw the case out of court immediately. And this is very scary to me. Former counterterrorism advisor Bruce Teft to the NYPD was sued by a Muslim John Doe police officer for workplace harassment for briefing NYPD officials after 9-11 about what Islamist terrorism is. And the majority of these cases are either lost or they are uh, thrown or they're dropped right before the discovery process. Because what happens in the discovery process? I, If you're sued for defamation but because you say X, Y, Z, organization is is funneling money to a terrorist group during the discovery process you have the opportunity to discover the financial documents so the majority of these cases are dropped right before discovery and whether or not the defendants lose in the end they still lose in time and money spent defending their rights and what has this created a detrimental chilling effect on free speech for example Yale Press Yale University Press published a book called Cartoons That Shook the World that were about the Danish cartoons of Muhammad. The book originally included the cartoons. After consultation with a couple experts, Yale University Press self-censored itself and took out the cartoons out of fear of being offensive. South Park, Comedy Central, that is a, a cartoon television program that defames uh, Jesus, it defames Moses, it defames Buddha, but when Trey Parker and, Max St and, and Matt Stone, the uh, creators of South Park, wanted to put a figure 
a cartoon figure of Muhammad, Comedy Central censured them and wouldn't let them do it. Random House re reneged on a publishing deal to publish a fiction novel called The Jewel of Medina by Sherry Jones about Muhammad's child bride, Aisha. And when the London publishing group picked it up, their house was firebombed. How many other people have been self-censored? We don't know, because that's the nature of the beast. And the point of these lawsuits are to stifle free dialogue about what is Islamism, what is Islamist terrorism, whether or not it's a threat, a threat, because if we can't speak publicly about it, if we can't debate these issues, then we will not be able to understand them and combat them. And the same technique is being mimicked on the international level. The Organization of the Islamic Co Cooperation, or the OIC, which is a 57-member voting bloc at the United Nations comprised of terror-sponsoring states and fascist theocratic regimes, has hijacked the General Assembly, has hijacked the Human Rights Council, and over the past 10 years has successfully passed Human Rights Council resolutions outlawing the blasphemy of Islam as a crime against humanity. For example, Human Rights Council Resolution 719 is an Orwellian document that not only criminalizes speech that is offensive to Islam, but also says ideas that are offensive to Islam are a crime under international law. So according to the United Nations, we currently have no Human Rights Council resolution on suicide bombing. We have no resolution outlawing terrorism as a crime against humanity. But thinking thoughts that are offensive to Islam, according to the United Nations Human Rights Council, is, is a crime. And I always thought, you know, I always learned in law school that the cornerstone of liberal democracy is the right to speak critically and freely about government and about religion. And yet the United States, under this administration, recently co-sponsored Human Rights Council Resolution 1618 that calls anybody who talks about Islamist terrorism, quote, an extremist, and condemns the negative projection of religion. Now, Hillary Clinton, just this past December, had a two-day closed-door meeting with the OIC to implement Human Rights Council Resolution 1618. And what has resulted is a top-down purge of all counterterrorism manuals. The uh, DOD just released today a report claiming that they have redacted the word Islam, the word Jihad, the word Islamist, from all counterterrorism manuals even if it's a self-described Islamist terrorist group like the Islamic Jihad terrorist group. Also, they have blacklisted anyone in the counterterrorism community whose presentation is deemed Islamophobic. And I'm talking about people who have been with the FBI for over 10 years, are now no longer to, allowed to teach at NDU. They're no longer allowed to brief our police officers. And you know, a symptom of this is the DOD report on Fort Hood, which omitted the word Islam and made absolutely no mention of the killer Major Nidal Hassan's well-documented jihadist sympathy, sympathies, such as his speech on suicide bombing, and an essay that he wrote arguing for the painful punishment and liquidation of non-Muslims. And that led to the classification of what happened at Fort Hood as workplace violence. And now we have the Council on American Islamic Relations working directly with the New York Times, calling for the resignation of NYPD Commissioner Ray Kelly for appearing in a film called The Third Jihad, which argues that there is a distinction between Islam and between Islamist terrorism. So I was hired in 2007 to direct the legal project at the Middle East Forum. And I provided for pro bono uh, legal representation, financial support to anyone who is exercising their First Amendment right to free speech about issues of public concern and national security, and subsequently got sued. And we coined this term Islamist lawfare, the use of the law as a weapon of war to silence and punish free speech about militant Islam. And after I worked there for about two and a half years, I realized that lawfare was more than just about silencing free speech. It was about the overall manipulation of Western legal systems and judicial processes 
to frustrate our ability to fight and to defeat terrorism. We see lawfare, for example, in Al-Qaeda manuals that instruct captured militants to file false claims of torture to reposition themselves as victims in the eyes of the law and the media. Do you know that not all four Navy SEALs that were charged with torture at Gitmo, all four cases were thrown out of court because there was not an iota of evidence that led towards uh, convicting them. And yet we elected a president partially on the platform that he was going to close down Gitmo. We see lawfare tactics being used by terrorist organizations like Hamas and Hezbollah that attempt to achieve legitimacy by hiring lawyers in Europe and filing war crimes charges against Israeli and American and British officials. Why is it that there are dozens of war crimes charges against the leaders of the free world, and yet not one lawyer has filed a war crimes charge against any leader of a fascist theocratic state? We see lawfare at the United Nations in maneuvering by the OIC to prevent us from coming to a definition of terrorism that includes the targeting of American and Israeli civilians. You know, sometimes I go down to the World Trade Center footprint and I conduct this experiment. I ask people walking by and I said, do you know what terrorism is? Can you define Islamism? It's over 10 years after 9-11, and our population exists in a state of confusion where we can't even define who the enemy is. And of course, lawfare is evident in the deliberate misapplication of human rights terminology and language, like the terms apartheid, like the terms genocide, terms that you can look up in a dictionary, but for some reason are being applied to members of the free world, and they're doing so wrongly. And of course, we see lawfare in the grossly flawed Goldstone Report, an attempt to, to take away the right of a democratic state to defend its citizens. And you know, I'll end with this. I'll never forget a conversation I had with a colleague of mine in the military. And I was complaining to him about the Goldstone Report, which is a report that was released by the United Nations uh, against Israel for going in and, and trying to kill the uh, Hezbollah officials that were targeting its civilians. And I was saying, this is, this is awful the way that they're targeting Israel. And he said, you know, you're wrong. The Goldstone Report is not about Israel. It's about setting precedents in international law that can and will be used against coalition forces. Forces fighting in Iraq and Afghanistan against the same types of terrorists that the Israelis are fighting, using the same techniques that the Israelis are fighting. And I realized he's right. There are shared implications for every act of delegitimization lawfare targeting Israel for members of the free world, because that's the way the legal system works. It creates precedents, and Israel just happens to be the easiest country to go after. So for example, if the ICJ, the International Court of Justice, thinks in their advisory opinion that they released that brick and mortar, a security fence on the border of Israel and the West Bank is a crime against humanity, despite the fact that the fence has, re has resulted in a very sharp decline in the loss of human lives. What then will that court say about a fence built on the American-Mexico border? If the ICC, the International Criminal Court, decides that it's going to exert jurisdiction over Israel, despite the fact that Israel hasn't signed the Rome Statute because of Israel's cast lead operation, what's going to stop the ICC from exerting jurisdiction over the United States? Because we haven't signed the Rome Statute under Clinton because he agreed that the court would be used as a politicized tool against them. So with that, I'm going to uh, introduce Ambassador Pierre Prosper. Now, Pierre Prosper is a very good friend of the Lawfare Project, and he's someone that we admire uh, very, very much. He's a partner at the law firm of Art Fox. Uh, prior to joining Art Fox, Ambassador Prosper was the US Ambassador at Large in charge of the Secretary of State's Office of War Crimes Issues. He was appointed in 2001 by President George Bush, George W. Bush, and he served until uh, 2005. Mm -hmm. And from 1996 to 1998, Ambassador Prosper served as a war crimes prosecutor for the International Criminal Tribunal for Rwanda, where he successfully prosecuted the first case of genocide under the 1948 Genocide Convention. And a huge part of lawfare is the failure to apply human rights law where it's needed most. The failure to hold the satellite companies that air terrorist media accountable. The failure to hold Islamist states accountable for the murder of their own children. And Ambassador Pierre Prosper is at the forefront 
of applying international human, human rights law where it's needed most. And for that, we applaud him.